number 199, please. 199, page number 256. As you're finding your place, let me thank Mr. Bell for leading the singing thus far. We're singing well. God love the world of sinners lost and ruined by the fall. Salvation full at highest cost. He offers free to all. Let's keep that good singing up. 199, standing as we sing. Let's stand together. singing. Now let's come before the Lord in a word of prayer together, please. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed as we come before the throne of grace together. Let us pray. Eternal God and loving Heavenly Father, as we approach thy throne this Sabbath evening, we thank thee for the love of God to us. We thank thee that it was wondrous love, marvelous love, and we praise Thee that that love, as the hymn writer put it, brought my Saviour from above to die on Calvary. We praise Thee for what the Word of God tells us, but God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And how we rejoice that in our sin, in our rebellion, in our lawlessness, in our criminality spiritually, how we rejoice that thou didst not leave us in that condition, but we thank thee that in mercy thou didst view us, in grace thou didst send a Savior, and we praise thee that Christ came to this earth, lived that perfectly righteous life that we would fail to live in 10,000 lifetimes, and we praise thee that then he died upon the tree, 
And as we consider all of those physical wounds that he endured, when we think of uh, the scourging upon his back, when we think about how they beat him, how they spat upon him, when we consider the crown of thorns upon his brow, when we think of the cross they then placed upon his back, as they nailed him to that tree upon Golgotha's hill, or when we think of the, the blood that flowed from all of those open wounds, and we praise thee not only for his physical sufferings, but the spiritual agonies of soul as well, as he bore our sin upon his own body on the tree, as we consider how the cup of God's wrath was poured out upon his very soul for all of the sins of all of his people, Oh, how we say hallelujah. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Oh, how we rejoice in Calvary love tonight. And oh God, we praise thee for each one in this gathering that can say hallelujah. I'm saved by God's grace. My sin is covered uh, beneath the blood. We thank Thee for the, the privilege of knowing that hell is no longer the portion of the child of God, but heaven is home for us that believe. But, O oh God, we pray that Thou would speak to those in this meeting that aren't yet saved. O oh God, Thou knowest we pray for them, and we plead before Thy throne for them, and we pray that Thou move in the soul even now tonight, even before the meeting be over, even before we open up the Scriptures and preach, Lord, speak to their hearts already through what they've heard in this meeting. We pray that Thou bring them to faith and repentance through Christ. Oh God, do it, we plead, and crown this house, crown Monish Lane Free Presbyterian Church with redemption. Thou knowest each one that has come in. Lord, Thou knowest the condition of the heart. Thou knowest even the condition of the heart, even amongst thine own people, those that may, may have grown cold of recent times, those that uh, have wandered into bypath meadow, those that aren't walking with thee as they ought to, uh, ought to be, and they're in a backslidden condition. Lord, we do plead with these saved souls tonight, restore the backslider tonight, revive thine own people tonight. And we pray that as Christ is preached, as the cross is preached, as much as made of the blood of Christ, we pray that thy word will not return unto thee void, but it shall prosper and it shall accomplish that which thou hast sent it to. O oh God, we pray that thou move amongst us. Remember each one that is in the gathering tonight. Bless them in their own souls as we gather around the word. We pray for those that can't be with us again tonight. We pray for those laid aside because of infirmity, because of sickness, we pray, encourage them, fill them with thy spirit. We pray that they would encourage themselves in the Lord also. And we pray for those that aren't here that could be here too. We pray, challenge them concerning that issue of being in the house of the Lord. But, O oh God, we pray, bless us now and help us in every aspect of this service to bring glory and honor and praise and exaltation unto the Master. For we realize Christ alone is worthy of the singing of our praises, of the reading of, wo uh, of the word, of, uh, of the preaching of his holy name. Oh God, help us to make much of Christ tonight. We realize that when Christ be lifted up, that he'll draw all men unto himself. So move amongst us. Move amongst us in saving power this evening. For in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Hymn number 205. Hymn number 205, page 259. Nought have I gotten but what I received. Grace hath bestowed it since I have believed. Boasting excluded, pride I abase. I am only a sinner saved by grace. And if you're a sinner saved by grace, sing it out. What a chorus. This is my story. To God be the glory. I am only a sinner saved by grace. 205, standing as we sing. Let's stand together.
Amen. That's wonderful singing. And if you can say that from a true heart, I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Say amen. Oh, you know, friend, we're all sinners. We're all lawless. But what wonder it is to know that we're saved by grace, those that are saved tonight. And friend, if you're not yet right with God, turn to Christ and be in time. That's what I plead with you. Be in time. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now, we're turning in the Word of God together, please, to the Gospel according to Luke. Luke chapter 5, please. <clears throat> Luke chapter 5. We're going to begin our reading at the verse 27. We're going to read down to the end of the chapter, to the end of the verse 39. If you're using a church Bible, you'll find the reading on page 1031. And in a moment, we're going to take the verses 31 and 32 as our text, looking at the title, The Great Physician. The Great Physician, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. But at this moment, Luke chapter 5, Luke chapter 5, and beginning our reading at the verse 27. <clears throat> and after these things, he went forth and saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, follow me. And he left all, rose up, and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his own house. And there was a great company of publicans and of others that sat down with them. But the scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, What do ye eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And they said unto him, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers, and likewise the disciples of the Pharisees, but thine eat and drink? And he said unto them, Can ye make the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. And he spake also a parable unto them. No man putteth a piece of new garment upon an old. If otherwise, then both the new maketh a rent, and the piece that was taken out of the new agreeeth not with the old. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved." No man also having drunk old wine straightway desireth new, for he saith, the old is better. We trust the Lord will bless the public reading of his holy, the Lord's holy and precious word to each of our hearts. <coughs> now at this point in our service, let me bid each one a very warm welcome to the house of God. We welcome those visiting with us tonight. And we trust the Lord will bless as we gather around the scriptures of truth and preach the message of saving grace to Christ alone. For, <clears throat> for the week ahead of us, please remember the gospel bus meeting on Tuesday. That's at 7 p.m. Also, please remember the parents' night and the prize giving on the last Tuesday of the month, the 28th at 7 p.m. I know everybody's very welcome to that and we'd love to see you there. But Tuesday, 7 p.m., the gospel bus for the boys and girls. Then on Wednesday, the prayer meeting and Bible study at 8 p.m., continuing on with our series in the book of Ruth. Then on Thursday, our workers' prayer meeting at 8 p.m. And Friday, the youth fellowship at 8 p.m. And God willing, Mr. Jonathan Story will be along to preach the gospel. And I trust young people that you'll be in your place on Friday at 8 p.m. Then the services next Lord's Day, the Sabbath school and Bible class, at 10.45, I would encourage young and old to come at that earlier time, children to the Sabbath school, older ones uh, above Sabbath school age into the Bible class. We'd love to see you. And then the morning worship at 12 noon, the evening gospel service at 7 p.m. Both of those meetings preceded by a half hour of prayer. Today is our retiring missionary offering as you leave, so please remember that. Once again, let me thank you for the maintenance fund offering of £430 that was raised last Lord's Day. As you leave, the Vision magazine is at the door. Please remember that. Take as many as you need. There's 10 more copies of the Reverend McIntyre's book on the Williamite Revolution at one pound. 
The LTBS calendars for 2024 at four pounds, that's a very worthy work. I trust that you will support it. And excellent calendars as well. Please take them with you. And then please remember there's a special week of meetings in our Dramore congregation, the 19th through to the 24th of November. And I know that you'd be very welcome to go along to those teaching meetings when it doesn't conflict with any meetings of our own. But please do pray for the sick and the shut in and those that have been bereaved of late. Please do remember those that are laid aside. And I know that they appreciate your prayers, but also I know they'd appreciate even a phone call or a rap on the door or just to tell them that you're thinking about them as well to drop in. I know that would mean a lot as well. But all these announcements are subject to the will and mind of the Lord. But we're going to sing again, please. Hymn number 208. Hymn number 208. We're singing well. Let's keep that good singing up. Sound the gospel of grace abroad. There's life in the risen Lord. Page number 260. Hymn number 208. We'll keep our seats while our tithes and offerings are collected up for the work in this place. But let's really sing it out. 208, please. life in the risen Lord. Now, turning in the Word of God again to that portion we read earlier, Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, please. Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, look at the verses 31 and 32 with me, please. These two verses will form our text for tonight, looking at the title, The Great Physician. And we read the Lord rebuking the scribes and Pharisees here, it says in Luke 5, verse 31, And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, 
but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Let's bow in a word of prayer afresh. Let's ask for the Lord's blessing upon the preaching of his truth, even tonight. Heavenly Father, we approach thy throne now, and we pray for thy help. We pray for thy blessing. We pray that thou be pleased to move amongst us, and we pray that thou give power from on high to preach the gospel that there is life in the risen Lord. O oh God, save souls, we plead, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The great physician. Each year in the UK, apparently there are over 300 million patient consultations that are had with a a GP or a doctor. You think about that, 300 million visits to the doctor. It's thought that in a year in the UK, there are 23 million visits to the A&E department in any hospital across the land. And this is interesting, and the interesting thing is that every single person that went to their doctor or went to the accident and emergency or anything like that, every single one of them of the 300 million patient consultations with a GP or the 23 million visits to a and &E, every single one of them had one thing in common. You all know what that is, that they were sick and they needed to be helped. They were sick and they needed to be helped. They were sick and they needed to be healed or cured or made better, whatever you want to call it. But do you know, there's a group of people that, uh, really it's quite sad actually, but there's a group of people that is, uh, worse off still, and they often say men are worse at this than, than the ladies, but it's those people that are sick and they say, I'm not going to see a doctor. <laughs> They're sick and I'm not going to the hospital. And I've had my own times like that, and I'm sure there's some here and you've had your times like that. You said, I'm not too well, I don't feel well, but, but I don't need the doctor yet. I'm not making a fool of myself going to the doctor. But when you think about it, how often we see that among so many spiritually, don't we? So many sick with sin. So many plagued with the disease of lawlessness and iniquity and, uh, and defiance against Almighty God. And there is that out and out refusal to come to the great physician, the Lord Jesus Christ. There is that outright refusal to come to the only one that can heal them from their spiritual sickness and can cause them to be cured by whose stripes ye are healed. Well, there's three things I want you to note about this illustration that the Lord gives us in the verses 30 and 31. I'll outline them for you now, and you can listen out for them later. But we find here, number one, the sinner. Number two, the self-righteous. And then number three, the Savior. And look what the Lord says again, verses 31 and 32. And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole... Need not a physician, need not a doctor, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now in these verses, I want you to note firstly, the sinner, the sinner. In these verses, Christ makes his mission statement very clear, very plain. We find he says essentially, I came to call sinners to repentance. I came to heal the sick. I came to do this work that it wasn't for the whole and it wasn't for the righteous, but I came to call sinners to repentance. Now, how often have we been like the scribes and Pharisees in this time? We find that in the verse 27, we read of the Lord calling Levi or calling Matthew as we know him more generally as, and he was a tax collector. And we find that it says in the verse 29 that Levi made him a great feast in his own house. And there was a great company of publicans and others that sat down with them. And we find that the scribes and Pharisees are looking in at the Lord having this feast with these publicans and others uh, notable sinners in the district. And they're saying, well, well we're okay. We're self-righteous. We're all right. We've got good works, but they are sinners. How often we see that even in Christendom? How often we see that even among church-going people say, well, I go to church. I, I do good things. I'm a clean living person. But, but you see that person right there? Or you see that neighbor of mine? Or you see that person over there that I work with? Well, they're a sinner. They need the gospel. Uh, but not me. I, I'm, I'm okay. I'll be all right. 
Well, here we find this attitude among the scribes and the Pharisees. And often we can be like that and say, well, look at them. Look at those sinners over there. But I want to submit to you tonight that however self-righteous you may think you are, however good you may think you are, however well off you may think you are, however many good works you may think will eventually get you to, uh, into heaven, I want to tell you this, that all of your self-righteousness is nonsense and is sinful and is dangerous and ultimately every single one of us are sinners in the sight of a holy God. Every single one of us are sinners in the sight of a holy God. Come with me to Genesis chapter 1, please. Because I want you to see where it all came from. Because maybe there is somebody here tonight, and you say, uh, but preacher, I am a good person. Preacher, I do good things. Preacher, I, I give to charity. Preacher, I am a good neighbor. Maybe you say, well, well, I do all these things and I, I've tried my best to reform my character and, and turn over a new leaf and do all these other various things. And, and maybe you're saying, how dare you call me a sinner tonight? My friend, I'm not calling you a sinner. The Word of God calls you a sinner. I'm going to show you where our sin came from. Look what we find in Genesis chapter 1. Look at the verse 31. We find that when this world was created, when everything for that matter was created, Genesis 1 and the verse 31, we find that God reviews his creation and it reads in verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And yes, that's in reference to the sixth day, but we also read that concerning day one, day two, day three, day four, and day five as well. Everything that God made was very good. It was without sin. It was very good. And we find then in Genesis chapter 2 that we find, look at verses 16 and 17 with me, please, that the Lord, when he created man, he gave a very specific command. Now, everyone looking this way before we read these verses, I want you to know that in Genesis chapter 2, actually Genesis chapter 2 is not something that takes place after the six days of creation. This is more detail given concerning some of the things that happened in the midst of creation. Because we find that when God created Eve and all of those things, he did that the same day he created Adam, by the way. So chapter 2 falls into the creation chapter. It's not an additional creation after the six days. I want to make that clear. But look at verses 16 and 17. The Lord gives a clear command. It says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now I want to ask you a question. Could God have been any clearer? <laughs> Could he be any clearer than that? If you disobey, if you defy my law, if you de defy my commands, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, in that day ye shall surely die. That's perfectly plain. And yeah, what do we read? Genesis 3 and the verse 6. Look at it with me. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Verse 7, And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. We, we find this is the fall. This is the fall of humanity. This is the fall uh, of all things in creation. We find that even the world itself still groaneth under the curse of the fall. Come with me to Romans 5 now. I think it's very important you turn here with me because maybe you're asking, well, okay, preacher, I understand what you've just read. I understand that God created everything very good. I understand that in Genesis 2, uh, God gave a very clear and specific command for them not to be disobedient, and if they did, in the day that they ate thereof, they would surely die. You understand also that in Genesis 3 and the verse 6, that they did defy God, and ultimately sin and the fall came into the world. But you say, but how did that affect me? As an individual sitting in Monish Lane tonight, in this gospel meeting, how does that affect me, Daniel Henderson, or whatever your name may be? How does that affect the individual in reality tonight in 2023? Well, look at Romans 5 and the verse 12. It tells us how. It says, wherefore, as by one man, as by Adam, 
as by what we read in Genesis, the Genesis account. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, look at it, and death by sin. And so death passed, look at it now, death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And this is the point I want to emphasize tonight. You see, because of the fall, all of us, every single one of us in this meeting are born in a depraved condition. All of us are born, as Ephesians 2 tells us, dead in trespasses and in sins. All of us are plagued with this disease of sin. Every single one of us have this issue. Come with me to Romans 3, just over the page, please. Because you say, no, preacher, you got it wrong. I'm a good person. No, you're not. You may like to think that, but no, you're not. We read in Romans 3, verse 10, there is none righteous, no, not one. You may think you're whole. You may think you're righteous. You may think you're a good person. You may think that you could earn your way into heaven. I break the news to you today. There is none righteous, no, not one. Verse 11, there is none that understandeth. Isn't that a solemn thought? That in and of ourselves, everyone looking this way a moment, we have this terrible plight and problem that we are so depraved in our sin and so darkened in the blindness of sin that we have no understanding of God or salvation without the Spirit telling us and opening our eyes. Look what we read in the verse 11 again. There is none that seeketh after God. You know when you read at times in evangelical circles, I found God. No, you didn't. If you're saved tonight, it's because God found you. The shepherd came for the wandering sheep when the 99 were safe at home. There is none that seeketh after God. Look at the verse 12. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Now you say, hang on, hang on. Don't get carried away now, preacher. What do you mean? There is none that doeth good. What do you mean there? Well, even the good works that people do, they do it out of a sinful motivation oftentimes. And you find they do it to be seen. They do it for the uh, plaudits of men. They do it to increase their own popularity. And oftentimes it's not done in a godly goodness. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. And the verse 23 summarizes the problem. We've already read it anyway in, the, uh, in chapter 5, but we'll read a similar thought. Verse 23 of Romans 3, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the verse 19 tells us, uh, Because of our sin, if you die in your sin, and if you stay in your sin, it says that one day you will stand before the great white throne of judgment. Verse 19, now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth, not just some mouths, not even the majority of mouths, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Do you understand how serious this is? Romans 6 verse 23 tells us for the wages of sin is death. Hell and destruction is our portion because of sin. That's what we deserve. That's what I deserve. I'm not stood in the pulpit because I'm any better than anybody else. I, I'd be honest with you tonight. Friend, I am a sinner and I deserve hell and I deserve the wrath of God as do you. All of us deserve that. That is the problem of our sin and our lawlessness and our commandment breaking and our many iniquities and transgressions. We are sinners in the sight of a holy God and we deserve to be punished. All of us do. Both you and I alike. And yet, come back to Romans 5. Romans 5 and the verse 8. You say, well, preacher, is that it? Is that the message you've got for us tonight? Is that it? Is that all that, that it's just you're going to preach sin and you're going to preach judgment and you're going to preach hell and there's no hope and there's no great eternity for me. There's no heaven. There's nothing like that. It's only hell and hellfire preaching. No, friend, look what we read in Romans 5 in the verse 8. For the sinner, for the reprobate, for those dead in trespasses and sins, says in the verse 8, but God commendeth his love toward us and let's just stop there a moment. You say, does God really know who I am? Does God know that I'm such a sinner? Does God know of my commandment breaking? Does God know about my many iniquities? Does God know what I've discovered tonight, that there's none righteous, no, not one? Yes, and he knows you better than you know yourself. 
And it says in that verse, But God commendeth his love toward us in the while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Oh, friend, there is no love like the love of Jesus, never to fade nor fall. And I want to emphasize the fact as we return now to Luke 5 and as we return to our text in the verses 31 and 32, Christ did not come, Christ did not die for righteous people, for good people. And I want to tell you this, none of us fit that bill. He came for the sin sick. He came for the reprobate. He came for me. Did he come for you? It says in the verse 31, Jesus answering said unto them, they that are whole need not a physician. We know this. It's obvious. If you're healthy, you don't need a doctor. But they that are sick, Verse 32, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. With that in view, friend, knowing that you were a sinner and Christ came to do what? To call sinners to repentance. The Lord tonight in Money Lane Free Presbyterian Church, in this very gospel meeting at this very moment, the Savior through this preacher is pleading with you to come unto him with a repentant heart. And I ask, will you do it? I ask, will you turn from your sin? I ask, will you turn from your many iniquities and your lawlessness? And will you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved? Will you do that? Will you know what it is to, to be repentant, to turn from your sin? Now listen, it's a hard thing to repent. You know that? We live in a, a, a day and generation of of evangelical, so-called evangelical churches where this sort of easy believism gospel is preached where they say, just, just, just believe. Or, or you'll hear phrases now and it's often peddled and, and I warn you against them to be very cautious with them. Uh, phrases like, just ask Jesus into your heart. Or things like that. And there's no repentance anymore. There's no preaching of sin. There's no dealing with our reprobate hearts and our wickedness and our guilty standing before a just God. You see, friend, the first point of salvation is this. You must repent. You must turn. Why do you think in Mark 1, in the Savior's very first sermon, he, pre he preached, repent ye and believe the gospel. He preached repentance and then believe. That's the gospel. That's how a man is saved. That's how a woman is saved. That's how a child is saved. He came to call sinners to repentance. Well, we've already established tonight that all of us are sinners. I ask, will you heed his call to repentance? But then not only do we find in our verse the sinner, the sick, the sinner that's called to repentance, but secondly, I want you to note the self-righteous. The self-righteous, look what we read in the verse 30, to begin with, it says, But the scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do ye eat and drink with publicans and sinners? <laughs> Isn't that some cheek, really? This is a, a sinner, a scribe, a Pharisee, scribes and Pharisees, and they're saying, Why are you eating with sinners? You see how they're trying to distinguish themselves from that group. We're not part of those people. We're not sinners. That's what they're saying. And we find that the Lord tells them in a broad sweeping statement, well, well, if you're not a sinner, I didn't come for you. I didn't come for the whole. He came to call sinners to repentance. It says, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He's saying, you're excluding yourselves from this wonderful gospel offer. You're trying to exclude yourself from the goodness of redemption and salvation that is found in Christ alone. Why would you do that? You may think that you're whole. You may think that you're good. You may think that you're righteous. But ultimately, no matter what the scribes and Pharisees thought, the Lord makes it perfectly clear that all of us are sinners, all of us are sick, all of us are in need of the Savior, and yet these people are excluding themselves. Why? One little word, self-righteousness. Self-righteousness. You know, I believe that Ulster tonight is full of self-righteous people. You know that? They say that's a big sweeping statement. Ulster tonight is full of self-righteous people. You know, on this Lord's Day... There has been an abundance of people that have gone to church. 
You know that? Oh, there's been thousands, thousands of people, tens of thousands that have been found sitting in a pew this Sabbath day somewhere in this province. And I would dare say an awful lot of them didn't hear anything of the gospel. And yet, many of them will say, oh, well, I went to church. I'm okay. I'm a good person. I'm a clean living individual. I'm just fine. I want to tell you this. However self-righteous you may think you are, nobody, no, no one is righteous. That's what Romans 3 tells us. We've already read it in the verse 10. There is none righteous, no, not one. You may think yourself righteous, there's none righteous. Come with me to Isaiah 64. Isaiah 64, you say, but, but preacher, th these are, are, are challenging statements and big statements to utter. How dare you say that? You don't know my good works. You don't know what I've done this week. You don't know the things that I've endeavored to do to be a good and a righteous and a holy person, yet I'm still living without Christ. You don't know the amount of money that I gave to charity this week. You don't know what I did for my neighbor and maybe looking after a, 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 an elderly relative or, or something like that. You, you don't know how many times I've been to church this week. I may not know any of those things, but I tell you this, however self-righteous you may think you are, you're still not righteous and you're still a sinner and you're still in need of Christ. It says in Isaiah 64 in the verse 6, look at it with me please, but we are all as an unclean thing. If you're in the habit of marking your Bible, I would encourage you to circle, highlight, underline that little word all, because that means you and that means me. But we are all as an unclean thing. And all, another word worthy of highlighting, underlining and remembering, so not only are we included as all in the unclean thing, but it says in the verse 6, and all our righteousnesses, oh, you say, well, well maybe it's getting better now. Maybe, maybe there's room for me and my self-righteousness. No, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all, underline that word again, to fade as a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Friend, it doesn't matter how good you may think you are. It doesn't matter how holy you may think you are. It doesn't matter how good you are at church attendance. I want to tell you this. If you're trying to earn your way to heaven, if you're trying to work your way to heaven, if you're trying to please Almighty God with good works to get you into glory one day, you will fail. You are an unclean thing. Your righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And one day you will fade as the leaf. We see that this autumn time, don't we? You will fade as a leaf uh, because your iniquities, like the wind, have taken you away and will take you all the way to hell. And yet we find in this verse, as the Lord speaks in Luke 5 and the verses 31 and 32, the Lord refers to the whole and he refers to uh, not calling the righteous. Well, well, the scribes and Pharisees thought that was them. They thought they were okay. They thought they were whole. They thought they didn't need any, any saviour. And we know that. Look at Luke 18 with me, please. <clears throat> Luke 18, I want you all to see this. Because in Luke 18, we find that the Lord, and it's very interesting at the start of this parable, the Lord tells us the type of people he's giving this parable for. The Lord tells us the type of people he's specifically targeting when he preaches this particular sermon. In Luke 18, look at Luke 18 and the verse 9. It says, and he, that's the Savior, Speak this parable unto certain, look at it, unto certain which trusted in themselves. I want to ask, is that you? The Lord has a message for you today. The Lord has a message for you if you're not trusting Christ, but you're trusting in yourself. And it says, look at it, what were they trusting in themselves? Were that, that they were righteous and despised others. Then he talks of this Pharisee. Two men went into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Isn't that an interesting phrase? Underline it, with himself. He didn't pray to God, just prayed to himself because he, he didn't have any standing with God. 
The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes at all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And look at this, friend. Look at verse 14. Very interesting. This is the analysis of the Savior, and it's the only analysis that counts. Verse 14. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. We find the Lord time and time again was hitting at these Pharisees, hitting at these self-righteous people, hitting at these people that said, I'm going to trust in myself for my own righteousness. I want to tell you this, however good you think you are, you're a sinner like the rest of us. You need Christ, otherwise you'll end up in a lost sinner's hell. Come with me to Ephesians 2. This is the gospel. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. You say, okay, preacher, maybe I am a sinner like everybody else. Maybe my good works and my self-righteousness is not going to get me into heaven. Well, what do I need to do? Friend, you need to put away your good works. You need to stop relying upon your own good doings. And you need to rely totally, solely, absolutely upon Christ and Christ alone as your Savior. And Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Very important words. Not of yourselves. And look at it. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You know, friend, I fear that there are so many, and they're just like these scribes and Pharisees. I fear not only in Christendom, in a sweeping general statement across even our own nation that so many are self-righteous. I wonder, is there self-righteous souls even in this meeting tonight? Maybe you say, well, well I'm not only a church attender. I, I, I'm a free <laughs> I, I I've come to Monish Lane for decades. Maybe that's you. Maybe you say, well, well, I'll surely be okay. I want to tell you this, friend. If you're still in your sin, you'll go to the very same hell as every other uh, so-called professing Protestant without Christ, or Romanist without Christ, or Islamist without Christ, or Sodomite without Christ, or Atheist without Christ, you go to the very same hell. doesn't matter how self-righteous you think you are. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. So then as we come back to Luke 5, not only the sinner and the self-righteous, but thirdly and lastly, the Savior the Savior, because look what we read, and it's wonderful. It is wonderful. It says in verse 31, And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. So he talks about a physician. There's somebody in view that can do the healing. There's somebody here that can resolve the, the problem, the situation, the sickness. Look at the verse 32. He tells us who the physician is. I, Jesus Christ, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Isn't it wonderful that in spite of the fact that we are sinners, that a Savior came, that there is a Savior, there is a Redeemer, there is actually somebody that can liberate us from our, from our sin, there is somebody that can deal with our sin, there is somebody that can cure us because He died for sin. As I tell you this, friend, Christ did not come to this earth and Christ did not die just to help you in your good works, to aid you in your good works, so then your good works will get you into heaven. He didn't do that. He died as a substitute in the sinner's room instead, and he died for sinners, and he calls sinners to repentance. Because as I've already said time and time again, all of us deserve hell. All, is, all of us deserve the wrath of God. And yet the word of God tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ left heaven's glory and he came to this wicked world of ours and he lived a, a perfect life. You see how you and I have sinned and sinned continually against God's law? Well, Jesus Christ, he didn't sin once, lived a perfect life. And we find that then 
after living that perfect life on behalf of his people, he died upon the cross. He died for my sin. He died for the sins of the child of God that's saved in this meeting tonight. He died for the sins of his people. He died upon that tree. Oh, when you think of all of the physical agonies he endured, when you think of the beatings, when you think of the scoffing, when you think of the mocking, when you think of the spittle upon his face, when you consider how they lashed him and they whipped him and they beat him, when you consider how they put a cross on his back and made him drag it till he could carry it no longer, when you consider how they, they nailed him through his hands and through his feet, when you think of all that he endured in the physical agonies of the tree as he shed his precious blood. And I want to tell you this, my friend. You ask, what was the difference between Christ and every other crucifixion? What was the difference between Christ on that middle tree and even the two thieves either side of him? What what was the difference? I'll tell you what the difference was, that he was the son of God, the God man, and he bore our sin upon his own body on the tree, and the wrath of God the Father was poured out his very soul, and in anguish he cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And Why did he do it? He died for sinners. And he came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I ask, is that you? Will you heed his call tonight? He died for sinners. He died for me. Did he die for you? Will you heed his call? Will you listen to his pleas? The word of God tells us, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Christ is the great physician. He is the great physician that can heal you from your sins. By his stripes you were healed. But I ask tonight, will you throw your whole dependence upon him? Will you come to him? Forget about your self-righteousness. Forget about doing good works to please God. Forget about trying to earn your way to heaven. Just come to Christ as you are. And friend, don't think this either. Don't think, everyone looking this way a moment, don't think, if I turn over a new leaf, then I'll get saved. Or if I've I got to reform my character a wee bit before I get saved. No. Come to Christ as you are. Come as a sinner to Jesus. And I promise you this. But the Lord has promised in his own word. He says, I will in no wise cast out. You come to him, he'll not turn you away. You cry to him to save you tonight, he'll not cast you out. If you repent and believe the gospel, you will be his, he will be yours. Heaven is guaranteed. But friend, Will you trust him now? Will you repent? Or will you leave through those church doors the same way you came in tonight? Relying on righteousness of your own, relying on goodness of your own, relying upon your own deeds and actions. Friend, I plead with you, come to the Savior. Make no delay. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the promise to the sinner tonight. What a wonderful truth. And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Well, all of us are sick. All of us are in that category. He says, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Tonight he calls you. And he calls you to repentance. All I ask is, will you come? Will you repent and believe the gospel? Will you be in time? We trust the Lord to bless his word to each of our hearts for his own namesake. Hymn number 221, please. Hymn number 221. <clears throat> Come every soul by sin oppressed. There is mercy with the Lord. and He will surely give you rest by trusting in his word. Only trust him. Only trust him. Only trust him now. He will save you. He will save you. He will. 
will save you now. Let's stand as we sing 221. <coughs> Let's stand together. Father, we do pray and we do plead that Thou would save souls tonight, that Thou would show individuals how simple it is to repent and believe the gospel. They will make preparation to meet their God even now. Give help, take us to our homes in safety. We plead these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>